Welcome to the initial and recurrent training courses for ODA inspection unit members that are provided in lieu of FAA required courses of the same name. I'm Julie Svoboda. Whether you are new to the conformity process and the ODA or have years of experience, this required training will introduce you to FAA delegation and the use of FAA Form 8130-3 Authorized Release Certificates. This will prepare you for upcoming face-to-face -face training for conducting conformity inspections. Different narrators will be participating in this module. You will see their names on the screens. Now, let's get started with the video module portion of Inspection Unit Member Training. Welcome to the VTDRB Online Training Modules. This module will cover the FAA delegation system and is needed for both the conformity determination training, where the modules are shown with the red arrows around the circle, and the training for domestic and export airworthiness approvals which are shown with the small red triangle going to the left. When you complete this module, you'll have finished part one for each of these courses. There will be an assessment at the end that you'll need to pass with a score of 70% or better. So it's important to pay attention to the material covered in this video. Our objective in this module is to ensure you understand the FAA's delegation system. This includes discussion of the history of delegation within the FAA the regulations that support the use of delegation, and how the FAA directs delegates to work on the agency's behalf. We cover a lot of this information in our ODA in-house training, but repeat the material here to meet the training requirements. Because you can't ask questions while watching this video, please jot them down as we go through the material, as there are a number of ways to get your questions answered later. First, feel free to contact the lead ODA administrator at the contact information provided. She's happy to answer anything sent her way. If she doesn't know the answer, she'll definitely do the research, reach out to those who know, and figure it out. There's also the ODA SharePoint that can be used to ask questions in a broader audience by posting your thoughts, ideas, suggestions, and questions, things you'd like to know in the news feed when logging in on the first page. Or... It's possible that a question has already been answered. The certification job aid is a place to look for specific items that have been asked and responded to in the past and is a great source of tribal knowledge. The modern age of power flight began in 1903 when Orville Wright made the first sustained power flight on December the 17th in a plane he and his brother Wilbur built. This 12 second flight led to the development of the first practical airplane in 1905 and launched worldwide efforts to build better flying machines. As a result, the early 20th century witnessed a myriad of aviation developments as new planes and technologies entered service. During World War I, the airplane also proved its effectiveness as a military tool and, with the advent of early airmail service, showed great promise for commercial application. Despite limited post-World War I technical developments, early aviation remained a dangerous business. Flying conditions proved difficult since the only navigation devices available to most pilots were magnetic compasses. Pilots flew 200 to 500 feet above ground so they could navigate by roads and railways. Low visibility and night landings were made using bonfires on the field as lighting. Fatal accidents were routine. Aviation industry leaders believed the airplane could not reach its full commercial potential without federal action to improve and maintain safety. At their urging, the Air Commerce Act was passed in 1926. This landmark legislation charged the Secretary of Commerce with fostering air commerce, issuing and enforcing air traffic rules, licensing pilots, certifying aircraft, establishing airways, and operating and maintaining aid to air navigation. The new aeronautics branch in the Department of Commerce assumed primary responsibility for aviation oversight. While the Department of Commerce worked to improve aviation safety, a number of high-profile accidents called the Department's oversight responsibilities into question. A 1931 crash that killed all on board, including popular University of Notre Dame football coach Knut Rockney, elicited public calls for greater federal oversight of aviation safety. Four years later, a DC-2 crash killed U.S. Senator Brunson Cutting of New Mexico. To ensure a federal focus on aviation safety, 
President Franklin Roosevelt signed the Civil Aeronautics Act in 1938. The legislation established the Independent Civil Aeronautics Authority, the CAA, with a three-member air safety board that would conduct accident investigations and recommend ways of preventing accidents. The legislation also expanded the governor's role in civil aviation by giving the CAA power to regulate airline fares and determine the routes individual carriers serve. On the eve of America's entry into World War II, for defense purposes, CAA extended its ATC system to include operation of airport towers. In the post-war era, ATC became a permanent federal responsibility at most airports. The post-war era also witnessed the advent of commercial jets. The British Overseas Aircraft Corporation introduced the first commercial jet service in 1952. The 36-seat Comet flew at 480 miles per hour. The top cruising speed of the DC-3 piston aircraft in comparison was about 180 miles per hour. By the mid-1950s, U.S. companies began designing and building their own jet on June 30, 1956, a Transworld Airlines Super Constellation and a United Airlines DC-7 collided over the Grand Canyon in Arizona, killing all 128 occupants of the two airplanes. The collision occurred while the aircraft were flying under visual flight rules in uncongested air. The accident dramatized the fact that even though U.S. air traffic had more than doubled since the end of World War II, little had been done to mitigate risk of mid-air collision. On May 21st, 1958, U.S. Senator A.S. Mike Maroney, Democrat from Oklahoma, introduced a bill to create an independent federal aviation agency to provide for safe and efficient use of national airspace. Two months later, on August 23rd, 1958, the President signed the Federal Aviation Act, which transferred the Civil Aeronautics Authority's functions to a new independent Federal Aviation Agency responsible for civil aviation safety. Almost a decade later, President Johnson was concerned about the lack of a coordinated transportation system and believed a single department was needed to develop and carry out transportation policies and programs across all transportation modes. In 1966, Congress authorized the creation of a cabinet department that would combine major federal transportation responsibilities. This new department was the Department of Transportation, which began full operations on April 1st, 1967. On that day, the Federal Aviation Agency became one of several modal organizations within the Department of Transportation, DOT, and received a new name, the Federal Aviation Administration. What led to this change in the transportation arena? Almost from its creation, the Federal Aviation Agency found itself faced with a number of unexpected challenges. In 1961, for example, the first series of aircraft hijackings in the U.S. occurred. In August of that year, the federal government began employing armed guards, border patrolmen recruited from the U.S. Immigration and Naturalization Service on civilian planes. In September, President Kennedy signed an amendment to the Federal Aviation Act of 1958, which made it a crime to hijack an aircraft, interfere with an active flight crew, or carry a dangerous weapon on board an air carrier aircraft. To help enforce the act, a special corps of FAA safety inspectors began training for duty aboard airline flights. With no dedicated office space for the Federal Aviation Agency, employees of the growing agency were housed in several widely dispersed buildings around Washington, D.C., including some temporary buildings of World War II vintage. Since being scattered caused difficulty in unifying the workforce, the Federal Aviation Agency worked to obtain a headquarters building to consolidate employees in one location. And on November 22nd of 1963, the Federal Aviation Agency's Washington headquarters staff began moving into the newly completed federal office at 800 Independence Avenue, which is very near the Air and Space Smithsonian Museum. Excitement about the new building quickly evaporated on move day as employees heard the news that President Kennedy had been assassinated. FAA responsibilities increased even more in the late 1960s. An economic boom brought with it growth concerns about pollution and noise. Aviation on the cutting edge of technological innovation 
became an early area of environmental concern for the public, especially as more and more airplanes transverse the national air system. With continued growth in the nation's airspace, it quickly became evident that airport safety and capacity had to be increased to prevent system delays. Between mid-1959 and mid-1969, the number of aircraft operations at FAA's ATC towers had increased by 112 percent. Scheduled delay costs the air carriers millions of dollars annually, not to mention the cost to passengers over and above inconvenience and discomfort. These types of concerns are what led President Johnson to creating the DOT and the current Federal Aviation Administration in 1967. The modern day FAA has been working since this time as shown through history working on many challenges. Over the past 50 years, aviation has become central to the way we live and do business, linking people from coast to coast and connecting America to the world. In fact, the FAA has created the safest, most reliable, most efficient, and most productive air transportation system in the world. But this system does not only consist of FAA direct employees. The Federal Aviation Act of 1950 was the original statute allowing the FAA to delegate activities as the agency thinks necessary to provide private people employed by aircraft manufacturers. Although paid by manufacturers, these designees act as surrogates for the FAA in examining aircraft designs, production quality, and airworthiness. The FAA is responsible for overseeing the designees' work and determining whether the designs meet FAA requirements for safety. The FAA system of delegation includes individual persons who are designated as representatives of the FAA and also organizations as designees that are responsible for entire certification programs. But way before 1958, the agency was appointing designees to better manage workload. In 1927, the first individual designees were appointed and that was 50 doctors serving as aviation medical examiners. In 1940, the first designated engineering representatives, DER, Designated Manufacturing Inspection Representatives, DMIR, and Designated Pilot Examiners, DPE, were appointed. These were individual designees. In 1956, the first Delegation Option Authorization appointed delegated organizations to aircraft manufacturers. And organizational delegations were further expanded in 1965 when the first Designated Alteration Repair Station DAS was appointed, Delegated Organizations for Aircraft Modification. Further, in 1969, the scope of work for Designated Manufacturing Inspection Representatives, DMIRs, was increased. In 1973, Congress questioned the ability of the industry to work for the FAA. Congressman Jack Brooks said, it appears the regulated are regulating themselves. Such a procedure is most unique and requires exceptional critical oversight. At the same hearing, the administrator suggested the act recognize the practical necessity of utilizing technical capabilities in the private sector in administering the many complex certification programs required by law. The chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board noted, safety problems involving delegations which have come to our attention involve such isolated circumstances that with one exception, it is difficult to apply any generalities to our findings. It is clear, however, that the problems have generally been related to implementation rather than the concept of the delegation program. That's actually been the case with delegation. There are very few problems with people functioning within their authority. So the FAA has continued expanding the program as needed. In 1978, Special Federal Aviation Regulation Number 36, SFAR 36 organizations were appointed, delegated organizations for aircraft repair. In 1979, the scope of work for DMIRs increased again, and in 1980, the first delegated engineering representatives were appointed for acoustic individual designees, followed in 1983 with the first designated airways representatives being appointed, again, individual designees. Most relevant to us was in 2009 when the delegated organization, DOA, DAS, SFAR 36, were terminated and the first new delegated organizations, Organization Designation Authorization, ODA, was appointed. Each time the program expanded, the regulatory notification provided justification for the expansion by saying service to the public by designees will be faster than service provided by the FAA. Overall, 
government costs will be reduced. Amendment 8 of 14 CFR Part 183 suggests that safety will be enhanced because FAA personnel are relieved from tasks accomplished by designated airworthiness representatives and will be able to redirect their resources on areas with a greater effect on safety. The delegation system continues to grow in numbers of designees today. So what exactly is delegation? The FAA doesn't have the resources to do all the certification activities necessary to keep up with the expanding aviation industry. Using the act of delegation to designees for routine certification tasks allows the FAA to focus its limited resources on safety critical certification issues, as well as new and novel technologies. In the case of ODA, VT DRB Aviation Consultants has been recognized as an organization that can be routinely delegated to. So we as a company often perform functions on behalf of the FAA, but we still coordinate on most of our projects to confirm that delegation with the FAA. Designees, on the other hand, are private persons or organizations designated to act as representatives of the administrator. It sounds kind of the same. Let's make a distinction with the context of ODA here though. ODA is comprised of several unit members. It's easy to equate the term designee to unit member, but that's not the case. Within the ODA context, the organization is the designee which fulfills its responsibilities through relying on unit members to do specific authorized functions. The ODA is the representative of the administrator while the unit members work within the ODA structure. FA Order VS 1100.2 lays out the vision and principles of the delegation programs. The vision of the delegation system is a robust and forward-looking system that increasingly leverages FA resources, responds to changes in workload and industry needs, demands the highest technical and ethical standards from its designees and ensures public, congressional, industry, and FAA confidence in AVS. Beyond that, the principles of which this vision is based on should be implicit in the day-to-day -day activities and management of the delegation programs. Delegation is essential to aviation safety. Delegation programs are necessary and the integrity of the delegation system must be maintained. Therefore, management of delegation programs is inherently governmental and must be a top priority within AVF. Delegation is a privilege. Designees serve the needs of the FA in fulfilling its safety mission, allowing the FA to leverage its resources. Designation is a privilege that conveys responsibilities, but does not imply employment or other rights unrelated to FA needs. Designees must be knowledgeable, qualified, and competent. All designee qualifications must be defined in objective standards that guide selection, oversight, training, and termination decisions. Designees have the primary responsibility for maintaining their qualifications. The FAA must evaluate designee competency at the time of selection and if appointed on an ongoing basis. Administration of delegation programs must employ a risk management approach. Effective use and oversight of designees requires a risk management approach that utilizes oversight based on differences in potential safety impact and likelihood of error. Efficient resources must be allocated to ensure effective management and oversight of designees. Resources include, but are not limited to, clear policy, appropriate databases and surveillance tools, and focused training of oversight personnel and designees. Delegation program evaluations are essential. Regular evaluations of each delegation program are required to improve designee and oversight staff performance. These evaluations will be accomplished at all levels of the organization to assess program effectiveness and efficiency. So, as an ODA, our delegated authority as an organization is a privilege. Our unit members who work under the ODA's delegated authority must be knowledgeable, qualified, and competent. We are regularly evaluated to ensure we are following our procedures and making technical, adequate decisions. The better we perform our duties, the less risk there is for the FAA to continue to delegate certification programs to us.
So we always strive to do what's right and ensure we follow FAA policies and guidance. So, you may be asking, what gives the FAA the right to delegate their work to private individuals and organizations? The Federal Aviation Act of 1958 has replaced with 49 U.S.C. 40101, which directs the FAA to promote safety of flight of civil aircraft and air commerce by prescribing and revising minimum standards governing the design, materials, workmanship, construction, and performance of aircraft aircraft engines and propellers. The public law also allows the FAA to leverage its limited resources through delegation. Title 49 of the United States Code 49 USC 44702D says the FAA may delegate to a qualified private person a matter related to issuing certificates or related to the examination, testing, and inspection necessary to issue a certificate on behalf of the FAA Administrator as authorized by statute to issue under 49 U.S.C. 44702A. Subject to regulations and review, the Administrator may prescribe, the Administrator may delegate to a qualified private person or an employee under the supervision of that person a matter relating to a the examination, testing, and inspection necessary to issue a certificate under this chapter, and b. issue the certificate. 2. The administrator may rescind a delegation under this subsection at any time for any reason the administrator considers appropriate. 3. A person affected by an action of a private person under this subsection may apply for reconsideration of the action by the administrator. On the administrator's own initiative, the administrator may reconsider the action of a private person at any time. If the administrator decides on reconsideration that the action is unreasonable or unwarranted, the administrator shall change, modify, or reverse the action. If the administrator decides the action is warranted, the administrator shall affirm the action. In 1962, the public law was published as Regulation for the Legislation Becoming 14 CFR Part 183. Subpart D of Part 183 specifically defines requirements to specific organization designation authorizations ODAs. The procedure the FA must follow to qualify, appoint, and oversee organizations in the ODA program are published in Order 8100.5. 14 CFR 183.53 subsection 8 requires each ODA to have procedures for acquiring, maintaining regulatory guidance material associated with authorized functions. Order 8100.15 paragraph 5-23 subparagraph 6 states an ODA holder is expected to comply with any certification guidance and policy applicable to the project. Each ODA holder must stay informed of the latest policies applicable to the projects it performs and propose certification plans that conform to these policies. This means you as a unit member need to stay current on FA policy changes and understand how FA provides guidance. Understanding the overall structure of the FA guidance as it relates to ODAs is important to help you know when and where to find current material. The FAA Directives and Guidance System is the means for issuing policy and procedures within the FAA. Though outside the FAA system, as we walk through so far, the U.S. Congress passes public law or U.S. Code. This is then put in practice through regulations that are published, such as 14 CFR Code of Federal Regulations, Part 183, or other relevant sections for ODAs, such as Part 21, Part 23, Part 25, 26 and 36. Within the FAA directive system, orders are published to describe processes FAA employees must follow to accomplish their jobs, such as Order 8100.15 for the ODA program, Order 8110.4 for type certification procedures, and Order 8000.95 for managing designees. Although FAA directives are written for FAA employees, the ODA must also follow the same procedures to the point that is reasonable. The ODA procedures manual contains the procedures the ODA unit must follow, and they are nearly the same as what is contained in FAA orders, but have been slightly modified to match the tools and steps available to the ODA. Notices 
allows FA to get information out quickly and then provides them some time to determine if that information should be a permanent change or if there's a different solution needed. Sometimes regulatory requirements and even FA orders aren't clear for industry. So the FA publishes advisory circulars, ACs, which clarify or guide people on what they are looking for. The ODA is also required to meet information presented in ACs. And finally, some situations don't fit orders or ACs, so the FA also publishes memos, policy memos, further defining their expectations. These are also expected to be followed by the ODA when they are relevant. Where could you find FA directive and guidance material? The FA RGL website is one that should be bookmarked as your favorite as it should be the first place you go for any FA material. At this site, you can find current information on orders, advisory circulars, policy memos, type certificate data sheets, airworthiness directives, and airworthiness standards. Plus, most of the historical information is also stored on this site. If you can't find what you're looking for in the RGL, try FA.gov. It is another method for finding what information the FA has published. Plus, there are many other government sources to get the information you're looking for, such as technical articles or operation information. You can look at FA.gov and find a lot of the information you're looking for, but also the Google search may be the easiest and quickest way to find what you need. Some organizations have documents available if you pay for them, but recognize the FA is a government entity, so everything they publish is free to the public and should be available with some diligent online searching. If you can't find something, let me know and we'll try to figure it out together. As an inspection unit member, always follow the ODA procedures manual. However, you also want to be very familiar with FA orders that provide specific guidance regarding inspection expectations. If you haven't done so, please review the following. Order 8110.4 type certification. Specifically, Chapter 5 is primarily addressing topics related to conformity inspections. Order 8130.2, airworthiness certification of aircraft. Also, FA Order 8130.21, Procedures for Completion and Use of the Authorized Release Certificate, FA Form 8130-3, Airwitness Approval Tag. Also, at least one particular advisory circular you want to become familiar with is AC 21-2, Airwitness Approval Procedures. So this wraps up Part 1 of the Conformity Determination and Export Airworthiness Courses. Part 2 of the Conformity Determination class must be done in a face-to-face -face setting. If you aren't sure the arrangements for this part of the class, please either ask your supervisor or send me, Melissa Sandow, an email. Part 2 for the Export Airworthiness class is also completed through a video module, which you can find on the ODA SharePoint. To get credit for Part 1, you'll need to complete a final assessment with a grade of 70% or higher. The link to the test is also found in the ODA SharePoint site. Please take the test and send me the results via email at the address shown. Thank you for attending this training session and we hope you have found it useful. Before you can receive credit for watching this portion of the online course, you must click on the link in ODA SharePoint, complete the accompanying assessment, and pass with a score of 70% or higher. We're looking forward to having you join us next time for another VT DRB ODA presentation.